Hello again, this is Earl Silverman, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Rheumatology. Welcome to back. When I highlight a paper of particular interest to the readership and interview three of the authors of an article from the April 2022 edition of the journal. The article I pick for more in-depth exposure is entitled Representation of Skin Color in Rheumatology Educational Resources and is by Dr. Chai Bahe and colleagues. The paper is now available at the journal's website at jroom.org for viewing, as well as an accompanying editorial entitled Rheumatology Education Needs a Splash of Color by Drs. Lisa Zucker and Brian Mendel from Washington School of Medicine, St. Louis, USA, and Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine, Case Western Reserve University, Cleveland, USA, respectively. T today, I'm pleased to be speaking to Dr. J. Bay, doctors, and Dr. Christina Krauss and Dr. Chitel Desai on, the on their paper examining the issue of color in rheumatology educational resources. I really want to thank the three of you for taking the time to speak to both myself and our listeners. So with that, let's begin. So um, would somebody please give me a, some background of why this you feel this issue is important and the reason you chose at this point in time to do the study. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Silverman, for having us. And uh, if I could start off the conversation, um, I, I think the question you ask is so poignant, too. And, you know, how to answer it's such a complex thing to go about. But I think for me, as a rheumatology fellow in training, really at the heart of the matter, it comes to my educational experiences and then my ability to, to impact patient care. Uh, I, I think we practice in a very diverse community, uh, all of us that see rheumatological patients. And it's so important to be able to readily identify the thing we see in front of us. And, you know, it's taking an eagle's eye perspective for me, just to kind of share my perspective on it. Uh, there's a really nice article written by a Lashara Nolan. She's a black medical student. And imagine this as a medical student having an article in New England Journal of Medicine. How cool is that? And so when I saw it, I, I took a lot of interest and I wanted to read it. And it really resonated with me in a lot of ways. Um, she talks about her experiences just being a medical student in the New England region and kind of trying to identify a Lyme disease rash and a bullseye rash, you know, how, how easy is it done? And every image she was seeing was white skin patients. And I, I think it resonated with me so personally because in my residency, I trained at University of Connecticut and we did see a predominant patient base of African Caribbean patients and Caucasian. And I'd have so many experiences where they'd come to me and ask like, hey, I got bit by a tick. What is this? And it's like, uh, I got to go look this up. It's a resident clinic. Uh, I got to get this done quick. And you're trying to go through it. And it's such a hard experience to do. And so it was so humbling. Uh, and to hear this and see it in paper and read through such an eloquently put article, it just, uh, it really resonated and just really brought back a lot of memories of my own training experiences. And then to go from that mindset, coming to the West Coast University of California, Irvine, and just very early on, you know, I'm about two, three months away from graduating. And just very early on too, I remember rotating to the lupus clinic with Dr. Desai, who's the director of the clinic there. And we care for a very diverse patient population, but there's a skew I'd say towards Latinx and Asian populations. And kind of the same thing, just in a different format of, hey doc, what is this rash? And it's like, uh, I don't know, <laughs> well, let me go look it up for you. So it's just, it's so uh, interesting to think about it in hindsight too. Because Dr. Sai, I remember early on, would tell like, hey, check out like ACR Image Bank, check out Hawkberg, Kelly's, they'll tell, they'll point you in the right direction. But it's funny, I just remember going through the text and kind of realize like, wait, hold on, like, I don't know if there's really stuff I can identify as the rash I'm seeing in clinic. It's what's being shown in the textbook. So uh, I think it was a culmination of a lot of things. And I think we're at a point in time right now, whether we want to talk about it or not, diversity, equity, inclusion, it's a rapid conversation that's happening. And I really think just kudos to the leadership. It sounds like there is a strong effort to make advanced changes and changes. And it's just uh, very exciting to be a part of that process too, definitely. 
Yes, and I completely agree with everything Dr. Bay said. From a dermatologic perspective, you know, we know that skin of color patients that have rheumatologic conditions may have more subtle or different findings on their skin. And so, um, depicting images of common and uncommon conditions in patients with skin of color is important. And we really need to increase our resident education materials to depict all these different skin types. I agree with both of you. I will say I need to give credit to Dr. Bay when he brought this to my attention and brought the New England Journal of Medicine article and said, listen, I'd like to evaluate patients with, you know, uh, you know, BIPOC patients in rheumatology educational materials. I had never thought of even doing that. And like he said, we see a very diverse patient population at UC Irvine. And I thought it was a wonderful effort for him to kind of undertake to see if what they actually refer to does prepare them to practice rheumatology in the real world setting. I think here, you know, I trained in Northern California many years ago, and I re always remember attempting to look at the rash, a systemic JAA on darker skin than I'm used to seeing. And it really was humbling. So I think we yeah. really do need this to get especially people with my color skin and used to seeing other, these different tones of red on different backgrounds. And I think that that is super important and the more we can do, the better. And especially in rheumatology where you have dermatomyositis rashes, you have lupus rashes, patients with sarcoid have rashes, their scleroderma patients have rashes, rashes are so pivotal to many of the systemic connected tissue diseases we treat, that if we're not able to pick them up in patients of darker skin, I mean, it just leads to delays in diagnosis and management, right? Yeah, so just, I, I, have to, I have to comment here. Um, it, I just thought about it when you said dermatomyositis. Uh, we do a dermatomyositis clinic with Dr. Mozafar as well. And we have a patient there. I thought it was eye makeup that the patient was wearing. Yeah. And, she was like, Jay, no, dude, that's not eye makeup. That's a part of her condition. That's a part mm -hmm. of her rash. So it's just everything is learning. Her heliotrope looks so <laughs> yeah. different on her. Right, than yeah. She had read in it. Like he had seen pictures and from the ACR image bank or the textbook that right. he literally thought it was something else. That's right, yeah. That's great. So moving from there to what exists. So what resources did you pick and why were they chosen for your, for your article? Right, thank you. Um, I'd say at first, kind of thinking about it or got organically, kind of just ad hocing it, it was just conversations really with attendings here at UC Irvine. And then also we cover Long Beach, the Veterans Hospital. And just kind of asking like, hey, what are high yield resources for me as a trainee to use? Uh, really the same ones kind of kept coming up and coming up and coming up. So uh, off the top of my head, I was very curious about obviously ACR Image Bank, Secrets, and then Hawkberg Kelly's was coming up a lot too. And Washington Manual, that's something I use a lot as well. And it's, it's very validating in a sense, too, because kind of going through it in a more formal manner, I just came across this really nicely put article, 2017. It's a fellows board preparation survey. And they had surveyed the graduating fellows at that time, like, hey, what did you guys use to study and prepare for these board exams? And it's, it's so nice to see that so many of the resources that just came up organically are the ones that are being recommended. And so kind of taking that impetus, we really wanted to go through not just what my attendings thought were important, but also just further validated at a larger national level, definitely. And, and I'll add here, I mean, that's, it was such a great undertaking where he said, you know what, let's use the top five resources that fellows in this 2017, you know, American Cultural Rheumatology Board Preparation Study actually looked at. And that's important because if that's what they use to study to supplement their clinical training, it's so important to be aware of what is in those, you know, what kind of images are being depicted in those um, guides or study materials. It, it's, I, I guess, just kind of speaking for myself in a training environment, uh, usually the first thing I ask myself if I don't know is, oh, what does secret say? Uh, but just thinking about it and kind of, you know, alluding to the data, I, I think there's only about nine images of color images in the entire text. So Already, if that's my first go-to textbook, and then after that, it's Washington Manual, which has no images, uh, I might be giving myself a bias too, unless I really take a step back and say, hold on, Shay, like I do need to kind of process this and 
think about it on a broader level too, definitely. Thank you. So we'll move on. Um, what was the methodology? I mean, we sort of get, got at it and it sounds like it right. was not formal, but really good. But if you wanna just expand <laughs> yeah. on that. Um, I will definitely need Dr. Krause's and Desai's help to kind of go through it. Because I, I think it does get a little convoluted because we wanted to make sure we did it well and correctly. Uh, just kind of giving the eagle's eye perspective, though, we tried, we literally went through every image available in these image banks. And then we chose to use the online versions, too, because often there were supplemental images. And so we tried to identify every color image in there depicting skin. And to identify that, we went through every polarized image under a microscope. We went through every x-ray and so on and so forth. And we found the images and we categorized them as either being light skin type or dark skin type. And we tried to use a Fitzpatrick scoring system or a Fitzpatrick skin type, which was, I, I've heard about it too, but to actually try to go through it, that was a great educational experience for me. And then we applied this methodology of, is it light skin, is it dark skin, or is it hard to say, is it indeterminate? And we apply that to every educational resources we went through. And uh, a big thank you to Dr. Krause for helping me out because that was uh, a process. <laughs> Well, I was thrilled when Dr. Bay and Dr. Desai approached me and they asked me to help with this. So it's really interesting. We use Fitzpatrick skin types because that had actually been done. I believe, right, Dr. Bay, it was a paper in the dermatology letter, where uh, dermatology journals, which was first a letter um, on skin of color in, I think it was also dermatology resources that they were looking at resident resources. And they classified, so Fitzpatrick skin types can be one through six. We used one through four as light. And Fitzpatrick skin type is really based on how you respond to sun. Do you tan? Do you not? Do you burn? And then also eye and hair color, which obviously for the images we reviewed, Dr. Bay, we couldn't go through eye and hair color. So it was a little uh, challenging. But we did one through four as light because we felt that by selecting for five and six as dark, we would be really fully representing what would be seen as darker skin or skin of color. And then I'll say that uh, Dr. Bay took a huge undertaking on his own as a rheumatology fellow to learn how to do the Fitzpatrick score, which any physician can learn how to do. But Fitzpatrick scoring of the skin is like a surrogate measure for evaluating for darker skinned patient populations. It definitely does not um, replace race or ethnicity, but in instances like this, when you're looking at educational materials where race and ethnicity are not actually depicted in the caption of the photo, and it's just a photo or an image of a patient, it's the best surrogate measure that we had available to go ahead and evaluate or ascribe some number and where they are when it came to skin of color. And so Dr. Bay did this on his own, went through thousands of images. And then when we were going through the data, I said, you know what, maybe we should consider validation because we've not been doing Fitzpatrick scoring for years and years. He took it upon himself to learn. And I said, we really need to reach out to someone in dermatology who has a lot more experience in doing Fitzpatrick scoring on their patients to validate the score on our patients. And actually then that way, when we interpret the results, it's much stronger, right? And Great. so we reached out to Dr. Krause and such a sweetheart to help us with this study and go through all the images with Dr. Bay and really correct. I think there was about a little bit over a hundred of mm -hmm. you know, the 1600 plus images that actually met the criteria that needed to actually slightly be um, reclassified. Right, we just wanted to make sure if we were gonna report numbers, we wanted to make sure they were meaningful and as accurate and valid as we could. Right, and um, to add on to Dr. Desai's point, I, I'm so thankful for Dr. Krause. And I know I've, I've spoken with you too as well about it, Dr. Krause. I just really appreciate your help on it because uh, we had the data ready to go very early on, but just it's, it's kind of scary to put out something so dramatic of a statement and it's like, I'm technically not trained in this. So it was just really nice to be collaborative about it and just to learn from, from a dermatology perspective too. Um, it just really opened my eyes. There's always stuff to learn. Uh, always subspecialty intercollegiality. It's so important. I, I definitely enjoy the process. Of course, I was more than happy to help. And I'm so thankful because you already did all the hard work. So then I just got to jump in and kind of confirm something. No, team effort, always team effort. Yeah. 
<laughs> it is. And, you know, when, just like you said, yeah. uh, Dr. Bay, when you're coming out and making a very strong, um, you know, comment that our rheumatology educational resources, uh, the number or the percentage of patients of darker skin depicted in them don't match what we see in our country. When you're making a comment that's strong, you want to make sure that the results are as validated as possible. So Great. that's why we brought dermatology into the mix. And we felt that this should be a collaborative uh, process. So that way we can validate our data before we actually take it to a journal. Yes, and certainly from our perspective, we need a validated gold standard in order to publish. You just can't say, well, they look darker to me, or they don't. It just doesn't have the, pass the test. So I, it really was an important part of your study, and I'm glad you did it. Although I had no clue what the Fitzpatrick scale was. Before. <laughs> and, and the Fitzpatrick skin type too, it does have its limitations, but out of the scoring systems we have, it is the best, you know, to our knowledge to do this. And that's the best that's been reported. So I have to be silly for a second, Dr. Silverman. If you have a if you ever went to Game of Thrones, uh, there's a Fitzpatrick skin typing done with characters from Game of Thrones. It's, it's pretty fun to follow along. I'm too old for Game of Thrones, yeah. <laughs> but I will look at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so as we move along, uh, could you, little, on a little more serious, I hope, could you please re review the major findings of your study? Yes, uh, would absolutely love to, and I, I hope I communicate it effectively. I'll definitely try, because uh, we covered so many things when we we're going through this process as well. And I think the, the brief of it, uh, the bullet point is we identified 1,604 images of color skin type. And of those 1,600 images, only 9% could be appropriately identified as dark skin type. 86 were light skin type. And then about 5% were indeterminate. Uh, breaking it down by resource, ACR Image Bank had about 856 images of color images. Only 12% of them were of dark skin type. Hochberg, there was 462 images. Only 4% could be identified as dark skin type. Kelly and Firesteins had 277 images. Of those images, only 7% were of dark skin type. For Rheumatology Secrets, I, I think it looks skewed here. I know we had kind of talked about it earlier. There's only nine images in their total. And of those, three of them were of dark skin type. And Washington Manual, just being a truncated version, had zero images. Uh, the other one too, to kind of go over in a systematic format is, you know, what were the most indexed conditions that we were coming across? Uh, I think the top five, six or so were scleroderma, vasculitis, lupus, dermato, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, and psoriatic arthritis. And just to kind of share some of those numbers too, when we talk about vasculitis, we identified 125 images of vasculitis, only 6% were of dark skin type. For lupus, there was 119 images, only 18% were of dark skin type. Um, dermatomyositis, there's 110 of them, only 5% of dark skin type. And I, I do have to give a quick shout out to Dr. Lax from UConn. I think he won the ACR Image Bank competition this year. He was one of my former mentors too. And the image was of a cutaneous dermato manifestation. So I just want to give a shout out for that. Uh, when we can talk about rheumatoid arthritis, this is interesting, not to talk about a percentage, but just to give the hard number. Two out of 110 images were of dark skin type. So the vast majority, uh, light skin type. Uh, gout, seven out of 80 or 9% were of dark skin type. And this is pretty shocking too. Uh, psoriatic arthritis, only one image of a dark skin type could be identified. You know, and, and just to highlight, to put those numbers, thank you for presenting those numbers, uh, Dr. Bay, but to put them in context with where we are right now, in the U.S. currently, uh, BIPOC populations, you know, make up, uh, what would you say, non-white populations make up right. over 20% of the current right, population right. in the U.S. right now. And by 2040, 2050, they're going to make up the majority. So when you're hearing these numbers, if 20% and of over 20% of the U.S. population are people of color, our educational materials fall far from what you're currently seeing in the United States. And then we all know when we practice rheumatology, whether it's lupus, myositis, scleroderma, um, psoriatic arthritis, 
our patients that are non-white, our minority patients, usually across the board have a higher incidence, a higher prevalence, and a higher severity of disease. So when you're looking at patients with lupus or psoriatic arthritis or scleroderma or dermatomyositis, where the skin plays a big role in helping you diagnose these patients, and you are not well-versed and well-trained in how to pick up these skin manifestations, you can imagine that adds to the delay in diagnosis and a delay in diagnosis in someone who has a higher risk of severity really compounds their treatment course over time. So when he presented this project to me and just kind of going over the process and the results and when we realized that the percentages of BIPOC populations using a surrogate measure like Fitzpatrick scoring was not matching the percentages in the United States currently, it became very clear that this is a very important issue that we need to address immediately. And as a non-American, I just want to know that all the educational materials are also beyond North America, where I think Canada is at least as diverse, if not more, than the U.S. of color, especially maybe not ethnicity per se. But remember, these are ACR slides, textbooks that have been quoted are not North American textbooks. These are used worldwide. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's even Absolutely. worse when you go into other co continents where we are the minority. The skin color, well, aside from maybe Dr. Desai, we are more lighter skinned than most people than most of our con the people who are reading it. So Good, that's actually so important. And how do you think this affects patient care? I mean, it's a sort of theoretical question, but it really gets at the issue of education and teaching materials. So right. I want to expand on the implications for patient care from your study. I, no, thank you for that question. Um, just as a trainee too, it's it's been, I think this work has been important in so many ways because it really does show room for growth. I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. And when it comes to education, uh, what we have kind of spoken about earlier too, it's, it's challenging when you have a patient show up, they're like, hey doc, what is this rash? And the minute the appointment's gonna end in 20 minutes, you gotta get it all done. And so just to have resources that can help me out in real time, uh, I think is gonna have such a huge impact. And I'm really excited about the, the forward progress that's already come about. It's a step in the right direction. It's very humbling and it's awesome to just see it happening in real time. It's not just these theoretical conversations of like, oh, we should improve, but, you know, dot, dot, dot. We will just kind of work it out later. It seems like it's happening in real time. I think if I recall correctly, the Image Bank competition did have a specific focus on BIPOC population. So, I mean, how cool is that is just to be a part of the conversation, but more importantly, the leaders at the top, they, they want to see it happen too. So uh, very happy. It's awesome. It's exciting. And, you know, just one thing too is when we had, when I had shared about that story about Lyme, arthritis, Lyme disease, however you want to call it, our textbooks technically don't have any images of color and ACR Image Bank as well at that time, at least didn't have any bullseye rashes depicted by dark skin. So it's, it's a, it's a very important issue. And to your point too, Dr. Silverman, uh, you know, the resources that we did allude to, they are the gold standard. And so, you know, you're talking about a population in this entire world, about seven, eight billion people. Um, people look different in different parts of the world. And so just to have a gold standard that's applicable to everyone, I think will be so helpful uh, just moving forward. And I know that we didn't talk about, uh, if I could say up to date, but it's pretty cool. I've, I've noticed up to date has already taken some impetus to kind of change the, the, the depictions that they have in there. Uh, resources. So that's, it's really exciting to see just in real time, seeing it happen for my eyes. And Dr. Krauss will agree. I mean, when it comes to psoriasis, how it really affects patient care, when it comes to psoriasis and darker skinned individuals, it doesn't look as dramatic. It's not this really, you know, obvious purple, red color on, you know, a light base with silvery scale. It can just look like a brown image that sometimes patients would not, or physicians may not even recognize, you know, primary care physicians, rheumatologists, 
we don't even recognize that that is psoriasis. You know, dermatomyositis patients with, that have skin of color, their rashes aren't as obvious. And you can see that if rashes are so important to actually even begin to think of these conditions um, and you, you don't even recognize the rash in these individuals, the diagnostic delay is real. Yes, absolutely. Um, and the other thing that I want to mention that Dr. Bay also had pointed out, I think, earlier um, and when he was doing the podcast is that there were a lot more images of cutaneous sarcoidosis in patients who are Black. What that also can do for the learner is it can bias you. So if you always see an image of sarcoid in a Black patient, right, when you see a Black patient come in with a rash, you might automatically assume oh, this is sarcoid and miss something more subtle, like a subtle presentation of psoriasis. And so I think we have to be a little bit careful how we depict common or even uncommon things in certain populations and just have every skin of color for every condition. And kind of that comment, just kind of tagging along what you said, Dr. Krauss, not only are you might be overthinking a sarcoid in black patient populations, but you may not even be considering it in non-Black patient populations on the other side, because every image you see in these textbooks and in these resources are darker skin patient populations. So you may get a Caucasian patient, a Hispanic patient and think that's not sarcoid because that's not what you see in your educational materials. Yeah, and Dr. Krause and Desai, and kind of building on those points, it's it's so funny that you guys bring it up because it's so true. Uh, me being a part of this like millennial generation, I'm into question banks. I'm into doing as many questions as possible to learn a process. And every uh, UWorld question I've come across, which is considered one of the gold standards when it comes to training a medical school environment, every question about sarcoid is always about black patient with XYZ and it's always sarcoid. And so I'm already biased with it. And it's funny too, to Dr. Desai's point, the majority of sarcoid patients I've seen here are actually of light skin color as opposed to dark skin color. <laughs> yeah. That's an excellent point of the reverse bias. And I think it just points out, as Dr. Krebs was saying, the balance is super yeah. important. So Dr. Jack, Dr. Bay, you had got a little bit into the final question I have. As you said, there's already some changes, but what do you, the three of you feel we still need to do? I mean, we have to make people aware, but are there concrete things you think we can do? Right. No. And uh, thank you. I, I think and it was it was a fun thing to think about, too, because Dr. Sai had kind of asked me when we were writing up the paper, like, hey, Che, like this is just the groundwork. There needs to be more from this. This can't just be the end of it. And so I was like, oh, my gosh, I haven't even thought about that. I was trying to put this paper together. So it was it was uh, important, especially someone that's going to be clinically focused, some interest in academics and research. But just, you know, how do you keep pushing the ball forward? Um, I, I think for me, just coming out of this training environment, what's been the most helpful when I look at an image is just truly having juxtaposed images, one of different Fitzpatrick skin types. And I know it can be hard to do every Fitzpatrick skin type, but at least a, a light skin type versus a dark skin type, I think would be so impactful. Um, I've, I've shared this with Dr. Desai. I don't know if I've shared with Dr. Krauss, but it's just funny because I, I, it's, it's a hindsight is 2020, you know, backseat quarterback kind of situation. In hindsight, I had seen an Afro-Caribbean patient in residency who had classic psoriasis in hindsight, but at the time I was like, oh man, what is this? So it's just having that immediate juxtaposition, I think would be so helpful just off the bat as a trainee at least. Agree completely. And I think the other thing is we need more studies focusing on, you know, the key differences in diagnosis and management of various um, rheumatologic disease in skin of color patients. Like Desai, Dr. Desai was saying, she mentioned that, you know, um, patients with psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis who are skin of color have worse outcomes. And so we need to, you know, understand better why that is. Are we, you know, are we missing diagnoses? Are we del like delaying diagnoses? And how do we better address that in, in addition to everything that Dr. Bay has already mentioned? And, you know, I would say the, the most important thing, which is um, kind of getting out there with this article and other articles is raising awareness. If you don't yeah, know yeah. it's a problem, no one's going to focus on fixing the problem. So I think step one is raising awareness across medical education. This is not just in dermatology. This is not just in rheumatology probably across the board in all medical education, we have not had equivalent depiction of imaging in people of color. 
and they have higher incidence, higher prevalence, and higher severity in a lot of disease states in and outside of rheumatology. And so step one is the awareness. Once you increase the awareness, I would say this is not something you can do silo by yourself. Collaboration is key, whether we do it just within rheumatology in centers across the country and across the world. But I think side by side with our dermatology colleagues and in other subspecialties that we work with frequently in rheumatology, whether it's nephrology or neurology or pulmonary, I mean, just getting by in other subspecialties and across the board, doing this as a combined effort and a collaborative effort, we can get to where we want to be a lot quicker than if we just took this upon ourselves in one institution, in one specialty. Well, thank you. Um... Anything you'd like to add that maybe we missed? Don't feel obliged. I thought it was great. Um, right. No, I, I think just for me, I, I'm really excited to be in rheumatology uh, just on a professional level. You know, I have the next hopefully 30, 40 years of my career to look forward to. And it's so cool to think about if we're already having these conversations right now um, at the end of my career, what is it going to look like? So I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. Definitely. And I just want to emphasize, I think what speaking to the three of you, especially with Dr. Krauss, just emphasizes what Dr. Desai said. Collaboration is the key. Yeah. I think we really, if we have any influence at the ACR in their slide selection, we need dermatologists there to help us pick appropriate slides and appropriate backgrounds. Otherwise, yeah. we are blind to color. I mean, we, and it's, it's a terrible, it's not good for education. And uh, I just want, you know, especially now as we're going more and more to online teaching driven by the pandemic, but also by people who are used to online. When you spend your whole life online, you go to online teaching where slides are different. Our slides are becoming more and more important which is good because I, you know, I teach my fellows, if there happens to be a lupus patient coming into our lupus clinic who happens to be of dark skin, and I say, you gotta lie them down, you gotta really think about it because it'll look like it's hypopigmented, but if it's really red, but our eyes aren't used to it. But if the next fellow doesn't have to come to, who comes to the clinic doesn't happen to see somebody that day who happens to have a rash, they miss it. So I think this is crucial. And I really want to thank you, all the three of you, for bringing this to the attention of rheumatologists and really for taking time to speak to everybody. And I hope, I believe, we'll, we will make a change, at least raising awareness of education and hopefully people's attitudes and ultimately what we all want is better patient care. So I do really want to thank you for the time and effort. And again, for everybody listening, please read the article entitled Representation of Skin Color in Rheumatology, Rheumatology Education Resources by Dr. Bay and colleagues. And to our viewers, the full length article is available as is the, on our website, as is the company editorial entitled Edu Rheumatology Education Needs a Splash of Color by Drs. Zucker and Mendel. And please uh, go to our website at jroom.org. And we'd love to hear your comments on Twitter at jroom or at uh, by our email at, j at manuscripts at jroom.com. And I want to thank everybody for listening. And I want to thank the doctors Bay, Krauss, and Desai for their time and effort. And I hope everybody will join us next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.